I can't believe that I did that because I don't ever do updraft. How's it feel to be a cartoon character? I know. I love I, that. I love that. I love the way I look. I made a great animated series. You know? Oh, it was great. I just wanted to start out by basically getting your comments about tonight. It'd be a great honor. Oh, it was fun. It was. It was definitely. And the movie just so great. I enjoyed every minute of it. Every minute I was watching, I remembered something, you know, from the making of it, which made me laugh. It was so much fun having Nancy sitting up in front of me. It's been a long time since you've seen her, haven't you? Uh, uh, that was the one question I was going to ask her. When was the last time we saw each other? I can't remember. It was so long ago. I think she had just come back from, from New York. I don't know if it was long ago. I noticed the audience was pretty vocal tonight. What do you think about that? Was that fun for you? or? Yeah, of course. Sure. You like an audience to react like that? You mean during the, the, the watching of the movie? Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the applause. And they seem to be very you know, courteous, but I glory when she came on the screen with applause and the uh, credits. I thought it was just for Nancy and I, but then when they did it for Polly, I thought, well, that's very respectful. And this is not the first time you've been here either, is it? You're I was here, here for Halloween. the Halloween, yeah, for the release of the DVD. So you like doing these Greek the fan uh, answer questions? Mm, well, it's not my favorite thing, but I think that the fans deserve it because they, you know, they're the one for reason the films have lived on this long. So if you know I get invited, I try to come. After seeing the film, uh, knowing it was made so long ago, do you think it held up well in all these years? Absolutely. You know, I was wondering my daughter and her friend were watching the fourteen. I could tell that they were watching the intent to even know and know that they've seen it on TV, but they did not seen it on the big screen. So I was curious to see you know, what they thought and if they enjoyed it. But uh, for me, it, I mean, I, I watched a lot of films. And, uh, and there were a lot of things I noticed probably for the first time. You know, I just thought the editing was incredible, and I thought the, the way he told the story without words, like I mentioned, it just it blew me away. You know? that I'm trying to produce films myself and realize more the work of a director versus my part as the actress mm -hmm. <laughs> or even the writer. I, I was very impressed I've talked to many people who've been in horror films, best films. Surprisingly enough, a lot of them don't even like the genre. What about you? <coughs> um, I like any film that's well made and I like any film where um, it can really suspend the, you know, my belief that a movie is being made because I always see the camera in the no matter what film. So if they can do that for me, What Lies Beneath was one of the few films that actually did that for me. I really got into it and scared by it and, and, and it's just kind of powerful. What about your children when they first saw it? I don't know if they saw it at an early age or what. Did it scare them? Carry scare them? Um, I didn't let them see it until they were a lot older. I think my son was maybe 13 or 14. for the most part, because there's the TV versions, and then there's, you know, so I don't, I don't really know, but certainly not when they're little. <laughs> you had a pretty full life. I get life, killed and everything. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, that's got to be like a major effect to see your mother just get fat I know. Well, well, you can interview her after. <laughs> <laughs> so just real quick, yeah, what do you think did. about that? When I saw Halloween, I cried when I was seven. Really? We went yeah. down to Orange County, but but actually she was upset by it. And, and they had a guy dressed like Michael Myers walking around the audience. Oh, that's nice. Even my son and I were scared. <laughs> I was scared. That was, and then we had a question, but the bonus for that was the next day they gave us tickets to Disneyland, so it made up. Oh, uh, there you go. Seeing her mother getting killed on the screen. <laughs> no, <laughs> but that wasn't me. It was my character. You have to right. remember that. Yeah, there's a separation there. I'm, I'm still here, you know. <laughs> Before you became an actress, you pretty much traveled all over the world, didn't you? Uh, well, my dad was from Holland and met my mom in Germany after the war. She was from New Jersey and um, he worked for an insurance company and because he spoke so many languages, he, he traveled all over the world because he opened all their branch offices. So I was born in Germany, then I lived in Morocco and then Venezuela and I high school buses and then college in New York and then lived in New York. You're multilingual? I speak French and Spanish, although it's really Spanish. Uh, French not as good, but Spanish. I lived there six years in Venezuela, so I really don't have a language. Interpret for a lot of people now. <laughs> so, how did the I always press, you know, one if you if you want to do this in Spanish, press one. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. So, how did your name go from Pamela to PJ? Um, in high school, I was always known as PJ because my name is Pamela Jane, and um, and I just never liked the name Pam. So, 
during elementary school, I guess, I was known as Pam, and it kind of irritated me. So when I got to high school, somebody, you know, asked me my name and said Pam Walter, and I said, oh, well, you know, how about PJ? Now, when you first started out, you did Break It Away. I believe you were credited as Pam Walter, right? Yes, that I did uh, just, you know, for my parents because my mother always hated the name PJ, so. <laughs> and I didn't really want to be known. That was actually the second second or third film and I was I was only because so I was married to Dennis at the time on location and they just needed one more body so I said okay we'll put Pamela Jane in the credits then that'll be kind of a gift to my mom. <laughs> so you started out as a model mm -hmm. and when did that career go Well through? actually I the first thing I ever did was commercials. Mm -hmm. I actually remember what they were? Mm -hmm. Chris Oil was my first commercial. I came in the summer, I was going to write for the college in New York State, and I think my roommate was from New York, came in with her. Um, we were going by the actor's studio. I read this thing that if you got a job there in the summer, you could audit. I got a job uh, running a spotlight for uh, Scott Glenn and Joanna Miles in the Seagull. I had to put the spotlight on Scott Glenn, and then I met uh, Joshua White of the Joshua White Show, and he introduced me to his sister's agent, Lester Lewis, and said, you know, you could, you could make money doing uh, commercials if you really could really make a living in that summer. The first commercial I went up for was Crystal Oil. I was a housewife for my first time and put it on. Before Florence Henderson, right? Yeah. And did, uh, <laughs> I did about six commercials before my agent, you know, said, you know, you should try modeling to make some extra money. And that's, you know, so I really started acting first and modeling. Back then, models really didn't act. So, and then I was in a soap opera. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Fantastic. And then I kind of had a choice. I could continue living in Manhattan. I was going up for Broadway shows, you know, just for smaller parts, but it was not the style. The, the life was really my kind of hard spot. So I thought, oh, I'll it So what really made you want to become an actress? Um, you know what? Uh, since I grew up in Venezuela and Africa and all these strange places in Brussels, it didn't occur to me that that was the occupation I was going to end up doing. I really was thought I would be an interpreter of the UN, or I was going to go for a political career, try to be an ambassador somewhere, because I really enjoy traveling and working with people, and I love being in foreign countries. Uh, but I was always in the school play, always had the lead role, always helped with the behind the scenes um, since uh, fourth grade in Venezuela, and always sang in front of people. Um, you know, did a lot of that, and, and even in high school was in all the plays, and it was editor of the newspaper, uh, newspaper for two years. And it never occurred to me that it was something you did for a living, because I never really got to watch a lot of movies. I wasn't a really typical, you know, movie-going person, teenager. Uh, but when I went to the actor's studio and Joshua suggested that I get involved in it, for me it was a summertime thing, or just be fun. But once I started making money and realized, oh, this is something, yeah, I kind of did that all along in my whole life anyway. I think I was it was a try. And, and since it sort of happened so easily for me, I think, uh, you know, the path was sort of laid for me. I didn't pursue it. When you were uh, in a soap opera, did you always have it in your mind that you could make it to film and branch on television? No, I mean, it was commercials, modeling, um, then I did the soap opera, I learned blocking, I learned how to memorize, I learned how to work in front of the camera. I, uh, because, like I said, in Manhattan, when you're there as an actress, the next logical place to go is Broadway. That didn't appeal to me. Someone said, hey, you should go out to L.A. It was sort of, it was as casual as that. Today, things are different, but it really was you know, time for me to move on. I had been used to living in countries for more than five, six years. I had lived in Manhattan for five years. I was ready to move on, and I, I had an agent who was going to turn me on to Nina Blanchard, so I already had a modeling agency. It was the first time I did my thing. There actually was some modeling gigs for catalogs, and, and then the big casting session with George Lucas and Brian DePaul. I was only here two weeks when I went to that session, and I only knew a couple of people here when I moved here, but you know, when you're young and don't have any other uh, responsibilities, it's easier to do. Now, uh, you mentioned that Carrie, of course, was your first movie. It was a wonderful experience, but you wasn't aware of the horror that had. Could you elaborate on that? <laughs> right, we want to know. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that was, that was sort of a joke. It's just that really Carrie was, because we were all the same age, uh, there was a competition. That's why I thought the baseball hat was great. I didn't really have to compete in being a pretty girl on screen. I could be the tomboy one. Um, we really just had such a good time. And, you know, 
And Brian was sort of the god of the set. He would speak and we would do, you know, and uh, and it just was a, an incredible working experience. And because it was an ensemble, there was a, a group of actors, so the pressure wasn't on any one of us except of course when the camera was rolling and it was our turn to speak. But, um, you know, and then after that I, I realized that some actors, uh, some directors don't really like to talk to actors. Some producers, you know, aren't crazy about their directors. And, and you get in, as you get older, you get into the whole politics of how a whole film comes together. And, and that's really you know, what I mean by that. People forget sometimes the show business. But, yeah, yeah, but, right, exactly. But I was lucky, I mean, working with John Carpenter at Halloween was an incredible experience. Alan Arfish, you know, in the Ramones, who brought me to high school, was great. You know, Stripes, like I said, Bill was a funny guy, hard to get along with, you know, off the, off the set, but, you know, still, uh, you know, I, I had fun wherever I went. <laughs> I heard that John Travolta actually recommended you for a period. Um, no, I met him when we were auditioning. He, he actually thought, pulled me into the Boring Plastic Bubble because he had such a good time, you know, making um, Carrie, and he was really just a, a, a great guy. He, he was very nice, very, didn't come on to any of the girls, you know, didn't do anything like that at the time. He was going on his personal life or anything like that, but he didn't seem to, you know, be interested in any of us in a dating kind of way, so we all felt very comfortable. I don't know if you want to answer this or not, i just say no if you don't, but okay. uh, I read something on the internet that you're still looking for uh, Quentin Tarantino for what he did with John. What do you mean by that? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he revives his career. <laughs> oh, okay, so it was in a good way. Absolutely. I took it like you were wanting oh. to hunt him down or something. Oh, no, no, no. I'm looking for someone like a Quentin Tarantino mm -hmm. to do for me what he did for John Travolta, because if you remember, John's career was really nowhere before yeah. that sure. movie, so that was, he resurrected him. Mm -hmm. And did you read the book of Carrie before he did the movie? No. Not at all? Mm -hmm. So you couldn't say that you were a Stephen King fan? Oh, no. Wouldn't have been my genre to read. <laughs> I was into reading, uh, let's see, T.S. Eliot at the time. I liked poetry. Um, I was uh, an Anne Rand fan. Um, James Mitchell. I was definitely not. <laughs> and knowing that you're now a producer, you've always had that filmmaking in behind your mind. There. Was there any parts of Carrie that dissatisfies you today that you would have done differently? If you were producer, director, or, or perhaps even writer. You mean in the actual watch, having watched the movie? Mm -hmm. And having watched the, the movie and seen it. The movie. Well, the actual film itself. In, huh? in, in the making of the film, or maybe even screening it today, if you could do it over again, what would you change as a movie maker yourself? Well, so that's a pretty hard question. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said to ask questions you've never been asked before. All right, and that was, that's a good one. <laughs> Uh, gee, you know, I, I thought that I, I would probably make it a little longer, and I probably definitely, if we're talking about 2002, would have taken out the slapping combat. That seemed, that really seemed very jarring. You watch the teacher slapping smoke, and smoking in the office, to that, I, you know, that was kind of weird. Uh, so probably just the, the violent elements and the, the, the crudeness between Nancy Ellen and Ellen. A couple, but, and I never understood why Travolta had that weird southern kind of picky accent. I don't really know. I always know. thought he was doing Benny Barber. Why did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> now, some of these questions were already asked, but I don't want to steal what's going on up there, so you know, it's okay. I ask again. Uh, tell about how the water hose broke your ear. Well, Dick Syker was the uh, stunt coordinator. In fact, he did the car flip. He was terrific. But when they had the fire hose, they actually had the fire department and the firemen were manning those hoses. And when Brian explained what he wanted the firemen to do, um, he said, you know what, I don't want to hurt that little girl and I'm not going to do it because the pressure of the water is really great. So Dick Syker stepped in and he said, well, I'll do it. I don't care. And he, I don't think he had ever manned a fire hose before because that thing just got away from him and he put it on my face and it just, went, I mean, it hurt so badly. And I actually, um, it hit my ear and I felt this horrible knife-like pain and I actually fainted because when it breaks your ear, it means that they're very dumb and 
into equilibrium and the balance, and I just fell right over. They used that shot, I mean, after yeah. that close-up, I'm then on the floor, and the staffer came in and picked me up, and Harry met me to my dressing room, and, and I was serious in there. Uh, the Tom and Emma came into my dressing room, and they asked, asked how I was. They called an ambulance, they brought me to the hospital, Culver City, so it was brought in where I later gave birth to both my kids, which is ironic. And, uh, you know, I had to, uh, I stayed in the hospital probably for about half a day, and they sent me home with drops, and I had to come back for shots, and, you know, it was a big deal, but we never really acknowledged that it happened to me, so that was kind of weird. Did it hurt you? And of course. Yeah. I found out since then that he's kind of a strange guy. <laughs> uh, did any of the other close stars come to your aid when that happened? I mean, you know, like... So, uh, mostly the crew, oh, yeah. because the crew adored us. You know, they were, these were uh, guys that were probably in their late 20s, early 30s, and then, you know, we were young, 20 ish girls, and gaping all the time, and they just would watch us and laugh, and think we were so cute, so the fact that something, you know, to one of us and Brian just completely ignored it. They were just right there. Oh my gosh. You know. <laughs> was there anyone you knew in real life that you based your own on? They asked you in the audience how you could be such a good, yeah. you know, but. Yeah, everybody has fun being a bitchy girl, you know. It's just something, uh, I, I don't think I really based on anyone I knew, but that probably was my idea and my vision of like an American naughty girl that I was never able to be because I lived in all these different countries and I had seen, you know, my dad was with an insurance company but everybody else, if they were in a foreign country, they were either a military brat or they, they were part of Caterpillar, which there were at least 20 families from Caterpillar or Exxon or something, but here I was with my dad with AIU and there was no other AIU kid, so. Um, they, most of the time, they had just recently come from Illinois or Texas and they had lived there their whole lives and they were spending just two years in the foreign country. So these were the American kids that I knew. So, so possibly, you know, from the I don't remember. <laughs> and the baseball hat came from again? I always wore the baseball hat when I first came to L.A. You know, the and that's the same in my I wore it for that first audition with Joe Tracy from Brian Palmer. And when he said he was going to put me on his list, he said, I'm bring that hat with you. And when I met with him, um, just for Carrie, he said, I'm bring the hat with you. And just went away. So. <laughs> Did the uh, patches have any significance? Mm -hmm. I noticed with patches on the hat. Yeah. Um, it was a cloud patch and rainbow patch. It was very into rainbows. Even in the North, I always had a rainbow scarf. Because it was such a dreary city in the winter, especially. I had a bright yellow coat. I had buttons from China. I wore a rainbow scarf and hat. And and it had three little buttons that, you know, it was during those hippie days. I don't really even know where I got them, but, uh, and, um, and then um, I put them on my hat. Just, you know, um, ultimately, those those three pins, though, are on my um, older brother was a pilot and he died in a tight crash in um, 1978. And, uh, and my mom was really upset, obviously, when that was in front of mine. Died and she was crying and crying, and he was married to a Catholic girl who um, his family was taking care of her funeral because she was in the hospital for the best in contact. And he was, they had this open coffin thing, and my mother was just crying hysterically, actually trying to wake him up. And I went over and uh, you know, I said, Come on, Mom, I pinned these pins that were my favorite pins in life on his jacket. And I said, you know what, if you could just give me any kind of sign that you're okay, <laughs> I would feel better because he was an older brother, he was only a couple of years older when I was, and I was very upset. And uh, it had been pouring rain, Tucson, Arizona, and I just pinned these pins on, rainbow pins, I go outside, it's pouring rain, and I opened the door, and I just asked him for some kind of sign, and the sky cleared, and this huge rainbow. There you go. Out. So it just made me feel like they were something. That's great. I've heard many stories of things like that happen myself. Uh, it had a very violent scene in it with the killing of the pig. Back in the day when that yeah. movie was made in the 70s, did you get any backlash from that? I mean, it wasn't you. You weren't in that yeah. scene. You know what Michael Talbot is with one of my best friends for years. He's since moved to New York, but <laughs> he works with Brian Danton. Um, uh, he was in that scene. Um, no, I mean, again, that question that you asked about as a producer today, I probably would take that out, because that was kind of weird. 
didn't really even see anything, but they got, you know, he actually chose one and said, there, I'll get that one. Come here, biggie, biggie. <laughs> oh, whack. <laughs> Well, that couldn't, that probably couldn't even be filmed today, could it? Uh, not with Peter, I doubt it, yeah. would really be upset, yeah. The, uh, special effects in there, were they, they pretty simple, or? Um, well, I mean, that car, you know, the car, uh, roll and explosion, that was all done with real stunts, you know, no special effects. And then, they always had that fire going, especially, you know, as he walks out, all that was... Uh, those were the days when they had to do a lot of real special effects. <laughs> Nothing, you know, like a week ago with computers. In uh, high school, the biggest Howard special effect I think was that twirling. Oh yeah, you know, that was a special effect. <laughs> That's one thing I couldn't do. <laughs> uh, in high school, how were you treated by other students? Were you picked on? Were you popular? <laughs> <laughs> He's always telling me I never, you know, I, I, I was a, a naive and innocent girl growing up because, uh, I, you know, I, I mean, I grew up, my high school was the International School of Brussels, so, you know, I had a lot of diplomat and army brats and uh, people from all over, so, um, I was also in a class of only 21 people, so, very, you know, I was very bright, I was editor of the school paper, um, I was in the plays. I wasn't the popular, popular girls because they were the ones that smoked and drank. But uh, I was serious. I was uh, loved my poetry and my writing class. So you know, I, I was there to learn. You know, but uh, that was not that was really popular. I didn't really date. Let me ask you a really strange question. I tend to do this. Uh, if <laughs> you had the powers of Carrie, do you think it would change you? <laughs> well, there's nothing I lacked when I went to high school. I wasn't thinking, gee, I w wish I was, although there was this one girl that had a pair of shoes for every outfit, so that could have probably come in handy. <laughs> Would I have gotten rid of somebody? There were a few teachers I didn't like, and I didn't like the uh, headmaster of the school, but uh, probably I, I wasn't the type of person to, to seek vengeance. I probably would have done anything. But I, I, I might have used those powers for good. <laughs> How did you meet John Carpenter? Um, at an audition, I mean, he actually called me in, and, and later um, somebody sent me uh, a copy of the DVD, um, the laser version or something, and they made a VHS copy of it. And he said on the track that he actually wrote the part for me. I was stunned because he never told me that. Although it was the first time I had gone had gone in for an audition, audition after reading, he said. You have the part. If you want it, you want it. <laughs> and that had never happened. You usually have to go home and you call your agent yeah. and you wait a week and they make you sweat and they you come back again. But on the spot and, and then later, you know, he said I was the only one that read totally the right way. And I thought, how the heck did anybody else read it except <laughs> that way? You know, <laughs> I was. I would have loved to have sat in on the audition. Now uh, you were talking about how the towels got a little smaller and smaller and carried. Were well, Nancy was. Yeah. Yeah. Were you nervous about? Doing I always the kept scene? a big towel. <laughs> but I knew my parents were going to see that and that was going to be the first movie and they were not happy when oh, really? I quit college to become an actress until my mother saw the crystal oil commercial and I started sending them presents from New York but they moved to Turkey the whole time I was in college and they didn't know what was going on at that time they were really upset. In fact I was transferring to Georgetown University from Florida from college and they were all uh, happy about that but uh, they were very upset, and so I knew I had to, you know, break it to them slowly. Not that I knew that I was going to do the scene in Halloween, but John Carpenter said, you know, if there's any way we could get any kind of, like, little bit of nudity in here, it would really be great. And so I thought, okay, well, let me just do this little sheet drop thing for a sec, and I'll be okay. But I have to say that, you know, killed my parents. <laughs> As a producer, uh, do you think that just a little bit of exploitation there helps or hurts it um, well, the movie I'm making now with female fighter pilots, um, I suppose it would probably help. You know, um, I don't, I don't think it should be the guiding force in the movie, but uh, you know, it, everybody wants to see beautiful girls, you know, naked. So, you know, but uh, in terms of that, in terms of Halloween, yeah, you know, I think it added something because it, you know. Especially since people try to, to psychoanalyze and say, well, the bad girls are the bad girls, but I think the bad girls are the bad girls, and that's 
much as that show. I, think. I would try to make us take two flies and things like that. Well. I mean, you know, I, I think it was okay. But it was just good pictures for me. Sure. How was the scene filmed uh, where Michael Myers finally off you? I mean, does that scene took a long time? Or? It took a long time only because we were laughing so much. <laughs> really? Uh, well, because he was just tickling me with the phone cord, and I just kept breaking up hysterically, saying, you know, this is not really going to work because <laughs> you have to do it a little tighter. <laughs> I can't fake it that badly. <laughs> He'd be going, mm -hmm. Oh, my. <laughs> and he was actually making me laugh. So, you know, I mean, I'm glad it turned out okay. <laughs> it was, it, was a set atmosphere Nothing took a long time with John, though, because really? he always had to do everything at one or two takes. Shot in 21 days. God, he did, he did the music <laughs> yeah. and everything, did he? did everything, yeah. yeah. Cut the <laughs> holes in the side of the That's film. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he made the film. <laughs> film stock by John Carpenter. <laughs> Do you have any funny stories about Jamie Lee Curtis? You've got to have some. Um, funny stories? Or Not really. embarrassing stories or, or whatever. Not really, only that, you know, she kept telling me that she wished she had my part because she had the boring character. And, uh, you know, at the, at the time, I didn't really realize, you know, that her dad was Tony Curtis and her mom was Janet Lee. She never talked about that. Uh, she was she was a, a cool chick, you know. She was, she was very interesting, very gutsy, uh, really wanted to do a good job. Um, but, mm, it wasn't really funny or anything like that. We, you know, we had a good time, but she was very serious. Because she, really? She was carrying a lead. <coughs> She, you know, she had a lot on her shoulders, and her character was kind of You talked about, uh, or maybe it was Nancy that talked about, excuse me, or that there was a lot of scenes in Carrie that we don't even know about. Yeah, Can I don't you know. tell us about those mysterious scenes that we've never seen, maybe in Carrie or, or even Halloween? Mm. No, Halloween, they didn't waste any film. Yeah. There were probably no, nothing that ended up on the cutting floor, not that I know. Um, in terms of Carrie, Maybe uh, maybe she's talking about some scenes that she had with John. I know that there were no other scenes that she, you know, she was only joking about she and I you know, and Chris, but I think there were probably some, some other scenes with him. Did you see, I, uh, I remember this did you see any of the many Halloween sequels? No. Is that true, or you just don't want to say? <laughs> Have I seen any yeah. Halloween? No, like, H2O is the only one because Jamie okay. invited me to the film. So you didn't and see then Halloween I got mad at her for not including the, the opening credits, at least, or flashback or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't have any aspirations about doing yet another horror film after Carrie, then? Um, well, it wasn't right after, because then I did, uh, let's see, I remember I did Carrie, and then I did um, Our Winning Season in Georgia, which was a great movie by Joe Rubin. I don't know if you've heard of that movie. Sure. I was a really, really sweet movie. I didn't seem like it was right after, and I didn't, I mean, I know it was in the same genre, but for me, after I met John Carpenter and read the script, I mean, that was like, you know, Carrie, I was one of eight, <laughs> and then Halloween, I was one of three, so that's how I kind of looked at it, and I was kind of like, kind of slow to be a bad girl. And what was this about, did you like the way you said totally? He said that I was the only one that read totally right when I did the audition. And I, I added a few more totallys than were in the script. So and you weren't even from California. That. And I wasn't, no, <laughs> wasn't even an American type girl. So a great actress you <laughs> so, were. <laughs> but then it confused me because when I saw the DVD and he said he wrote the part for me after seeing me and Carrie, I thought, well, you never told me that. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, meeting Alan Arkish? How about the Rock and Roll? Um, well, uh, they, I think they, they had an open casting for that, but not as many girls, but I remember meeting and we just clicked right away, and I liked him a lot. It was Roger Corman, um, who wanted me to have blonder hair, and I don't know what he thought, but uh, I just thought he was as crazy about me as Alan was, but <laughs> now I heard later that Roseanne Arquette was up for the part, too, but uh, I'm glad that she was. I'm very glad. <laughs> that, that is, you know, the utmost favorite movie. I mean, I, I've been fighting for a couple of days trying to find a DVD, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can get it. So uh, yeah, well. Show your mom in the back. And well, yeah. we got Prize it. has it. We got it, and we had it on, like, we were holding it for They were holding it for us, and we called them, and we're like, do you have it? Because we couldn't find it. We called them, and we 
we uh -huh. asked, they're like, yeah, we have one copy. They're like, okay, can you hold it for us? They're like, yeah. We went down there and they're like, well, we don't have it. We don't hold stuff for people. And we're like, uh, so they, they put we it back through. somewhere in a store. We're looking through the <laughs> we whole store. We went like three and hours they put looking it back for it and we still couldn't find it. Well, I know Fry's has a big supply. I always go down there and buy it for whoever says they can't find it or whatever. Before the film, were you aware of who Roger Corman was? Yes, but not to the extent that I know. Really? Yeah. You didn't have I any mean, I know Jack Nicholson started sure. with them. I heard all these stories, but I never, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not now because I'm older and I don't know about movies. But, you, know. you think because you were in Carrie and, and uh, Halloween that it may have caused you not to have any aspirations or you know, thoughts about working with who is known as King of the Cheapies? Um, didn't even think of that. I mean, really? uh, I mean myself. Did you have any say in the clothes? I mean, that was all made up by wardrobe, or did you design? No, I, I bought all the clothes. So you bought all I, the clothes. I literally spent my salary <laughs> and I went out and I went to Fiorucci at the time, was still in Beverly Hills, and uh, I bought everything. And it was all my wardrobe. Deborah, Deborah and the Doodleman actually married John Landis was the wardrobe girl, and, uh, and she just, I just kept showing. And this is what I'm going to wear. Okay, well, that's good. And this is what I'm going to wear for this scene. <laughs> so this was so. by choice? Or, or Corman that was said, my character. we no. don't have the money. You have to buy your own wardrobe. There was $150 in the budget for my wardrobe. Really? And I said, all right, well, then I'm buying my own because this is how I see this character. <laughs> and I went out and I loved all the clothes. The, the thing, the striped thing, and then my sneakers out of my pocket with a comb in it. And, and, and a few things that people had given me, like the scarf, a knitted scarf when I'm setting up the chair in front of the theater. Some things I wear just, you know, to say hi to people. <laughs> now, now, Rip was supposed to be a punk rocker, right? Mm -hmm. But yet she wasn't really dressed like, you know, what you'd call a punk rocker to be. Well, she was a songwriter. She wasn't really a punk rocker. She was a songwriter, and she, you know, in my, my interpretation of that was somebody that was very serious about the craft of writing songs and she just happened to pick the Ramones, you know, because she wrote this great song that she thought that they could, you know, do. And she was the ultimate Ramones fan, right. but she herself, I didn't think, was a punk rock. And I understand you had actually met the Ramones and, and actually uh, performed on stage prior to the movie, is that right? No, no, this is after the movie. Oh, I thought they that played, was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they played at the Roxy one night and, and uh, I went up on stage with them. What was that like? It was great. We sang Rock and Roll High School. <laughs> you weren't great. nervous about singing in front of an audience? No. No. How does it feel to be on a record album? All of a sudden it's you're great. a pop star? Hey, I get uh, four times a year from Warner Brothers. I get, you know, $36.25. Really? You're still getting <laughs> I still get royalties. Far out. And they, it's great because they list all the countries and how many units they've sold. So I can always tell which country. Brazil and Germany, man. They love those and wants to know. <laughs> they said a breakdown of how many units sold all around the world. And what do your children think about your song? Rock and Roll High School? I, I don't know, know what their taste are so in music. About but <laughs> well, you can ask my daughter that. There you go. Yeah. Good kids. <laughs> they like Grease and Rock and Roll High School. <laughs> and uh, the uh, concert scenes, that was done at the Roxy there too, right? Right. Yeah. What was that like? It, it, was that like a long shoot to do that? Yeah, it was, I think it was like three days and it, and it was long and it was uh, it was hard for them because a lot of the times when they would be shooting with them actually performing it was in the day and they weren't really day people so it was kind of hard for them. But, and the crowd was raucous, you know, they had to keep, they, they kept inviting in people that weren't necessarily extras as people that wanted to see their moms and they were a pretty wild bunch. In the scene where you're smoking a joint and Ramones are appearing everywhere. Yeah, in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, can I ask you if that was a real joint? No, it, it wasn't. wasn't. It was rosemary. It ah. was stunk and it was terrible. And uh, I, I smoked about four of those and got pretty sick. <laughs> That's pretty bad when you have to do multi-takes and oh yeah. like, please. <laughs> but there wasn't any pot smoking going on on the set? No. Oh, no, no, no. Alan, I think, wasn't like that at all. And, and the Ramones, I don't remember. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't notice any drug taking even from them. But like I said, they were so shy and uh, you know tried to be the woodwork. You know, they were, you know, 
and they didn't even want to order food and they just got pizza. Well, you know, every movie's catered. You have these incredible uh, catering wagons and, and banquet tables and they would just kind of go over there and peek like, are we allowed to take something? And they'd be like, sure, help yourselves. And they'd like take one thing and like scurry off. I mean, it was so funny that they, they thought they were beneath this movie making machine, you know, because they, they were Roger Corman fanatics yeah. and they loved Halloween. So, you know, and Carrie, so they were suddenly, you know, on the set with people they have been looking at going, oh, wow, I'm really good. So, it was cute. I mean, I just thought it was so cute. And you weren't really a Ramones fan. You liked Jackson Brown, is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I couldn't believe I'm you know, able to the cassette and to go home and listen to these people. You're their number one fan, and I just, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> I can't even listen to the whole record. <laughs> but what about now? Do you think you're a fan now? Now I'm definitely a fan. So can I have your comments on uh, how you felt when you heard about Joey and Judy in the past? Oh, very, very upset about, um, about Joey. In fact, that, that day I think I, I wrote something for the website for Joey. Did I write it for his website or for his yeah. I wrote it too. I wrote it. Oh, I yeah. sent it to them. Oh, yeah. I wrote a, a long thing just about my reflections of working with him and the kind of person he was and then and then his brother read it and then corresponded with me via email and said that that was really beautiful and uh, the thing that he wrote to me was that it was so nice the words that I wrote because in rock and roll high school I was the kind of girl that his brother really would have liked to have gone out with it was nice to know that me, as a real person, was able to say nice things about him. And it really touched him and his family. And since I've pretty much been in touch with his brother and his mother, and you know, it's, it's kind of funny. They invited me to Thanksgiving last year because I was in the New York area. And they invited me to be part of the, the annual Joey and Mom birthday that you know, I couldn't make it the last two times. They, they, you know, they can't really afford to send people tickets, and they couldn't really afford to spend money and the hotel. One of these days off. This is very refreshing to me because one of the downfalls of, of my job is when I interview people, you expect them to be like they were on a screen or they really like this or that. And they're so different. And, and to know that you, you really do like cult films and, and you thought oh, the yeah. ones are great. And, oh, and yeah. all that's fantastic. Uh, I'm very about sad about Dee Dee. I mean, sure. I didn't really know him. I probably knew Johnny the most because he was the one that was, uh, you know, talked the most on the set. Joey hardly said anything, he really didn't talk at all, but, but Johnny, you know, liked film, liked to talk about film, and I had seen him a couple of times in LA, and he talked, but, um, uh, Dee Dee, I didn't know at all, and I just felt very sad, because when they did that rock and roll, you know, all the mm -hmm. he was like patting himself on the back, like what is that? <laughs> that was so weird, but I had no idea he was still addicted to drugs, that was yeah. very sad. And you were injured on that movie, too. Yeah, that, I don't, I can't remember. I mean, somebody, I, I don't know where, I don't remember even talking about that, but I don't remember. Oh, except maybe it was at the, maybe it was in the Roxy. Maybe that's what I don't I don't remember. You get injured a lot on, on sets? No, or? no. <laughs> that's not a recurring theme. <laughs> what about any bloopers during Rock and Roll High School? I, I imagine it was just crazy all the time. The things that, that were funny that might wind up on Dick Clark someday. Who knows? Uh, probably anything with the Ramones because uh, they had a hard time with their lines. In fact, the Ramones probably had um, about ten more pages of dialogue, but. Uh, they didn't, uh, you know, after the first day of shooting, it was evident that we weren't going to be able to pull it out of them. And, you know, I actually worked with them you know, sometimes before we go on set, but they, Alan just said, you know what, we don't have the time, we can't work with them, we can't do it, we can't to go. So they, they would have had a lot more dialogue, but they just couldn't do it. And it's true that you guys got in a band in high school and you actually blew it up? Is that right? I heard the uh, blast was a lot more than supposed to be people running out of their houses and wondering what's going on. And is that that we actually what got in a van? You actually blew up a high school. Well, I mean, you got we, in a van in high school. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. down in Watts. There yeah. wasn't. Yeah, it was said to be demolished anyway, and then they set it on fire. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't remember the people running out of their houses. But well, the internet tends to... <laughs> there were a few yeah. people toasting marshmallows. Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like working with some of these people? Uh, just maybe brief descriptions. Uh, Vincent Van Patten. Um, great, funny guy, nice guy. Clint Howard. Oh, crazy guy. <laughs> he is so cool. He's, like, He's very cool and very crazy. I worked with him in another movie called uh, Merchants of Death now. It was called Born, but that my neighbors did Claire uh, and Ross Hagen. It is just a hoot. Not everybody can have a brother to put you in this movie. That's right. Day Young. Um, Day Young. Oh, Day Young. Day Young. Yeah. Yeah, Day Young. Uh, she was great. I loved her as Kate, and we became really good friends after that. She was, she was a really nice girl. Mary and Paul. Great. Paul was great, and uh, Paul Mary, Bowie Gods. Mary Warnoff was so good, and really talented artist. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. it was really incredible. We did. Uh, Alan Arkish did a. A TV movie for Showtime called right. Shaker Island Rock that, that Renee Zellier right. was I have that on movie. DVD. She was adorable in that and it was so great seeing Mary and Gary again. It was cute that he, that he had us in for that. It was kind of strange because your, your name was like reversed. It was like a combination of your name and Principal Togar's name. Was that done on purpose? I don't remember that really. Really? But I think Mary was more of a really yeah. good friend of Alan. Now, in this movie, you were anti-rock and roll. They kind of strange being reversed. Yeah, well, All of a sudden, well, that's, your what, that's what Alan, yeah. you know, thought was so fun. He didn't even know how to be the mothers. Yeah. So, you even played, like, cops and everything in movies. Uh, do you think you're playing more establishment to where before you're playing anti-establishment? Uh, well, I don't know. When you're younger, you can play more loud roles, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I'd like to play a part like Piper Laurie now, though. <laughs> And uh, Carrie. <laughs> and the film was originally going to be called Disco High? Yes. Well, that was the only way I guess Alan could sell it to mm. to uh, Roger Foreman. Glad they changed it. <laughs> yeah. Well, he all he knew all along, but he yeah. just was pitching it to him. And what about uh, Rock and Roll High School forever? In fact, it was going to be Disco High with Naked Girls. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that wouldn't play in the South. <laughs> What about Rock and Roll High School Forever, the very crappy sequel? Do you see the, I mentioned it today. <laughs> that, that's really Please. bad. I, I'm ashamed to admit that we have it. I don't, I think I, I have it just I can't believe that Mary it. was in it. Yeah. I can't believe it. Did they offer it to you at all? They never, no. They, uh, they act, I did have one interview with the female director, Deb or something, whatever, I can't remember her name, but, and I had all these ideas and whatever, and she basically, you know, walked me to the door and said, thank you very much. That was dealing with she would make a call again, and I thought that's weird. But I then wrote a treatment um, with my then agent's boyfriend, and uh, we actually got Roger to uh, sign a deal with us, and we got a deal with a company they wanted to do it, and we got all all the original people signed up. They all agreed they would do it. Wow. The Ramones were going to come back together oh, just for man. the movie, and then Roger doubled his price once we had a deal with the company. So I didn't say 250, I said 500, and we went, well, but that's not our budget, and that's not what you signed. He said, so see me. I would have thought he would have understood that. It was Mr. unbelievable. Budget, you know? uh, unbelievable. It was really, very mean of him. <laughs> he blew uh, our deal. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. Uh, do you think that uh, in Shake, Rattle, and Rock, that that pretty well is a representation, your character in that movie, that is pretty well a representation of what maybe Rick Randall would be like today in older age. No. No? He'd still be <laughs> no. rocking then? Or? <laughs> well, hopefully she would have, uh, you know, become as uh, famous as Carol Bersager or any of those song women songwriters. What's that one? What do all the time? Diane Warren. Diane Warren. She would have become Diane Warren. That kind of stuff, though. No, not that kind of stuff, but that popular popularity. Yeah. Did you get any back? Then a video, uh, yeah. MTV video <laughs> film director. There you go. There you That's go. That's what we're did you get any backlash over the comment that was made about uh, your former husband and wife, Horse Meg? Did you get backlash from that? You had said because you had felt that, that Meg Ryan was a bigger star than he was, and that's why he divorced. I said that? That's what it said. It's all over the internet. Seriously. Why did I say that? I Let's see, do we have an exact quote in here? No one is mad at me. <laughs> yeah, it, it, said that, it said that you had recently talked with Dennis. What is it? Where? Well, I'll have to send you the link if I can do that. Oh, okay. But it's, I swear to God, it's all over the internet, and it said that you recently talked with Dennis, and he was very sad about his breakup. Right. And to that you, was, it, yeah, to you in your magazine. opinion, you had felt it was because that Meg was a bigger star than he was, 
and uh, his ego couldn't tolerate uh, being married. That. that doesn't sound like you. I didn't believe Never that. Never said that. That's bizarre. Yeah. Well, it's the that's internet for you. Fair. No, it's not fair. <laughs> it's stupid anyway. Though. That is stupid because you know. Meg, Meg no. divorced it's Dennis so anyway. <laughs> Meg divorced Dennis anyway, so that would be yeah. interesting. And this uh, movie you're making about the aviators, is this is going to be for uh, theatrical release? Mm-hmm, Paramount. you have a name? Sure. Untitled Female Fetter <laughs> Poet. Well, this is not the first so movie you've that's the name, UFFP. UFFP. <laughs> <U-F-F-P. laughs> title. Are you going to be that's in this or are you just producing? No, I think it's going to be younger girls who are flying here in the combat theater in their 20s. No, I'm going to give myself a role, but I'll yeah. probably have to be some army uh, colonel or something. <laughs> Air this, Force colonel. This is not the first film we produced, right? Um, well, that movie Boring It. Yeah. It down, and but, what was that like? Uh, that was okay, but that was sort of a token, you know, credit because I, I helped pull some people into it and you know, it wasn't really what I'm doing now. Now I'm yeah. really working hard. <laughs> and what was it uh, like doing Jawbreaker? Um, that was fun because Darren Stein was so you know, he, he just idolized Bill Cat and I, and he's had to have us in our movie when he was about 28 years old, and he, he loved Carrie Rock in high school and, you know, Halloween, and so you know, he just wanted to have me be the mom in his movies. And, and I, I just thought he was a genius, I mean, I just thought that movie was, had some really good stylistic elements in it, and I don't think as a whole, the movie, I think it was just a little too rough for the kids today, you know, as my daughter, but... Yeah. Uh, so if it had just been a, you know, a little less Rose McGowan and uh, Marilyn Manson-ish, I think it probably would have been more successful. It, it should have been a little lighter like Rock and Roll High School yeah. was, and that's what I thought it was going to be from the script. But then when I saw it and it was just, just took this dark turn, I was like, oh. Marilyn was no Joey Ramone, let's put it that way. No way. <laughs> uh, everybody <laughs> seems to center on basically the big three in your life. You've done many, many films. Uh, what other films haven't we mentioned here that you think are just as good as Halloween, Carrie, and Rock and Roll High School? Um, well, let's see. Um, I really like Private Benjamin. He's just a really cute movie. I like my part in that a lot. And, uh, I like, I didn't have a big part, but um, I'm proud to have been in Sweet Dreams because I thought just a lot of great job. <laughs> How do you want to be known as an actress? Uh, do you mind being called a, uh, a screen queen? Well, I don't feel that that's really fair because, you know, of Rock and Roll High School and Stripes. So, yeah. you know, I think that, you know, I don't mind, but I think... And then they also classify me as a queen of the bees or a cult movie mm-hmm. person, but Stripes wasn't a cult movie. Mm-hmm. I just, I would like to be thought of as, you know, having done a wide variety and big range of movies that are still popular today. Oh, you kind of went the whole gamut between actress and, and movie maker. So, what about your children? Do they have any aspirations? And do you want them to be in the business? Oh, I really wouldn't like them to be kids anymore. My son's 18, so he's, he, he can't, he can't do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and they both, you know, my son's at the basketball and uh, he's in the Academy right now, so I'm proud of what he's doing. And my daughter is a wonderful piano player. And, you know, people ask me all the time, well, you know, why don't you get them to model, uh, your daughter in modeling or acting? And, you know, it really has to be something that you want to do and, and something that you're doing all the time. It's no life for kids. Do you think it was easier to get into the business back when you first started out than it would be today? Absolutely. And today it's just. It's like the music business, they're just looking for that one hit, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, and I think it's turning, though, it seems to be turning where more and more they're, they're wanting to go with the artists that, you know, are developing themselves and singer songwriters again versus just the one hit and put it on a pretty place, so I'm hoping, you know, that the turns the same in Hollywood, because they're, they're always looking for those young girls that, you know, if they get one or two movies with me, that's enough, you know, or a sitcom like Friends, and then, you know, you get millions and millions and millions of dollars, <laughs> and it runs for seven years. <laughs> and if you could do it all over, would you have done anything differently? Or you're happy with the way you've done things? Um, you know, you can never have any regrets. Um, I probably would have liked to have kept working, even though my kids were little, maybe one, maybe a year. 
if I could have stayed at the level after stripes and gone on to the next thing after stripes and built from there as opposed to now and, you know, and I'm totally happy that I put in the time with my kids but I think I could have probably maybe done one, one good movie a year if, if you know my career at, would have allowed that to happen but you know I was offered a lot of garbage yeah. I mean, it was constantly reading garbage and saying, well, this is just not what I was going to do. So I'd have to say this script really never came my way, but I would have, you know, really wanted to sacrifice my time away from my kids to do it. That's probably one of the downfalls of doing cult films, is you have to find the yeah. good ones to filter it out until the garbage comes through. And there's just, you know, when you're a, a, a young girl in the business, there's just a whole other set of circumstances that come into play in Hollywood also, you know, so once you're married and you're, you're pregnant, you sort of, that shuts one door, <laughs> you know, are they okay? <laughs> so much for her. <laughs> Next. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate all this. Okay, yeah, you're welcome. Glad we could rescue Glad you from the fans show. outside. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> well, they're always so nice. Oh, that, that's the best part. You know, of it, and yeah. they say, oh, we, you know, to get your autograph for years or will you take a picture and then you put your arm around them and they're like shaking and you yeah. go, that's oh, okay, I'm just a person. Yeah. <laughs> so Palmdale, eh? You got to drive uh, back now? Yeah. We, <laughs> oh, we do come this a lot, on. So. Do. I actually All saw right. Palmdale mentioned in the... Um, I, I had to remember, listen, you want to talk about the internet and how crazy things are. I heard back yellow. in the 80s... Yellow. Oh, well, it's yellow. I heard Wait, back in the 80s shot. that you had actually yeah. quit acting and became a member of a religious cult sometime? Maybe that was because of a role that you were in. Never played in a... Pen. Uh, <laughs> oh, you go pen. thick with this one and yeah, thin okay. on that one. Unless there this one's go, red, but go. I think black would look better. Thank you, Joel. Is there any particular place? Well, you and know, would you want me to... It doesn't matter.